Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. It's getting cold here in southern New England. Kind of like it, though. Sweatshirt weather. Tired of the heat, anyway. How you guys doing? Good? Bad? Good? Good. All right. Uh, history sum uh, summarized. Overly sarcastic productions. Byzantine Empire. The Golden Age. If you are new, my name is Connor. Hello. I'm from Rhode Island. America. Uh, I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. Get as many people from as many different countries as I can to subscribe. And so we can have a better... Uh, I feel like the more views we have, the better grasp of world history we can get. I think that's pretty logical, right? Uh, let's do it. I'd love for you to join. Hit all the buttons. Original link to the video. Top of the description. Let's go. The Byzantines made Golden Disaster Empire their entire damn brand. As we'll see over the next 15... The Byzantine Empire has long maintained a delicate balance of simultaneously doing fantastic and also being constantly in peril. Normally, this would be a contradiction, but the Byzantines made Golden Disaster Empire their entire damn brand. As we'll see over the next 500 years, the Dark Ages brought some genuinely brilliant reforms, while the Golden Ages endured some Dark. catastrophic failures. But just like the Romans of old, the Byzantines kept on keeping on despite the odds and earned their place as one of the longest-lasting empires in history. So so, to see how the Byzantines survived the Middle Ages and gained their golden reputation, let's do some history. When last we left our purple-robed friends, the entire southern it. half of the empire had been swiftly yoinked by the shiny new Muslim caliphate, Wasn't and within good. a century, these Muhammad. two neighbors had landed on Constantinople's doorstep on, on two separate occasions, only to be repelled by the very fires of hell itself. See, the Byzantines had a little trick called Greek fire, a secret Napalm. substance that could be shot from a siphon at an incoming navy and burn down everything from the mast to even the water. But the problem that I, I, I have with this is from what another video told me. I forget from which channel it was a while back. Where the worst thing you can have on a ship is fire. It is an uncontrolled fire, and so it would be having any sort of flamethrower technology would be very uh, a great weapon and everything. But it would probably cause your ship to catch fire more often than. It would seem to be more of a liability than a uh, an asset. So, I mean, I, I guess they, they found a way to use it here. But that's not all the Byzantines had learned from the fall of Rome. In addition to their functionally impenetrable Theodosian walls, they maintained hundreds of underground cisterns to fortify their water supply. No city on Earth was better defended than Constantinople. But the same thing couldn't be said for the Byzantine provinces, as the Muslim armies were having their run of the place all the way up into Anatolia. It was... That's so true, by the way. You got these two seas. You're on a um, an isthmus, or I, I guess it's uh, penin two peninsulas, but almost. Try and say that word, isthmus. Uh, right? Isn't that? But anyways, two mountain ranges on you know in the southeast Balkans and uh, in Turkey, and uh, yeah. It was only in provinces, as the Muslim armies were having their run of the place all the way up into Anatolia. It was only in 740 that Emperor Leo III finally held the eastern line, and his son Constantine V fortified the other problematic frontier by pushing back against the Bulgarians in the west. So it took a century and a half there, but hey, credit where it's due, that's a pretty solid recovery. However, there's a more literal reason that this stretch is considered the Dark Ages, and it has to do with icons. The Byzantines were a rather artistic bunch, and they loved to have images of Jesus, Mary, and friends in their churches and in their homes. But in the eyes of people like Emperor Leo, this was beginning to look a lot like idolatry, where images are worshipped more piously than even God. His response, simple enough, was to smash every last image he could get his hands on. So, starting in 726, Over he and his reaction. fellow iconoclasts destroyed every mosaic, fresco, statue, and doodle in sight. Constantine V eventually doubled down and even began persecuting the clergy for spurring this apparent idolatry. Meanwhile, across the Adriatic, the Pope in Rome was justifiably horrified, and Byzantine Ravenna took the occasion to declare independence, which is why their mosaics are some of the few to actually survive this mess. After Constantine died, his wife Irene called a council to outlaw iconoclasm, but Emperor Leo V reinstated it, and then eventually Empress Theodora re-outlawed it for good in 843. Yeah, the fine. final rules were that statues are no bueno, but all 2D art was- What? <laughs> that little baby is doing the, uh, why does it look like a grown man's face in a little baby's body? 
in 843. The final rules were that statues are no bueno, but all 2D art was chill, so the Byzantines got back to work with gorgeous frescoes and mosaics. Greek art would proceed to snub visual realism in favor of more stylized figures, with enough gold decoration to give a Protestant a seizure, and that style governs Eastern Orthodox art to this day. So while I weep on a weekly basis for how pathetically few pieces of original art survived iconoclasm and the Ottomans, the dreaded double whammy, I can take comfort knowing that the Byzantine style has well- Sorry, I just thought of something. If I don't say it, I'm not- Do you think there was- Like, did they- They must have. Alright, people are people. Is there historical records of, like, professional, like, pornographic- <laughs> Like, have there ever been found- Uh, there must have. And I'm not talking about, like, the Kama Sutra found, uh, over in India, where it's- It's more detailed and professional, I, I, I guess. But just- a ancient world's version of pornography. There must be stuff like that. Son, I found this tablet under your room. These three lines. Well over Sorry. a thousand years of concept weep on a weekly basis for how pathetically few pieces of original art survived iconoclasm and the Ottomans, the dreaded double whammy, I can take comfort knowing that the Byzantine style has well over a thousand years of continuity. But for all the damage the iconoclasts did to art, they made some crucial reforms to the Byzantine military and government by, well, making them the same thing. See, back in the old Imperial Roman days, the provinces had no innate defenses and they had to wait for the legions to show up from Jupiter knows where. Clearly, that model didn't work anymore, so the Jupiter. Byzantine reconfigure where. their armies and their provinces to fit. In the 6 and 700s, the provinces were gradually redrawn as themata, with the governor taking on the additional role of strategos and overseeing both the civic and the military care of his thema. And in place of the old-fashioned imperial legions, Byzantine themata each had their own army, staffed with citizens from that specific thema and funded by land grants within that thema, so every soldier had a tangible stake in the well-being of the empire. Though the empire did shrink to about half its size between 6 and 800, the extremely perilous eastern border went from being an unmitigated disaster zone to a fortress. The Byzantines were stronger and safer than ever thanks to the Thema reform. Okay, so it looked like they were just on the road to rapid collapse uh, in the last video, which I'd recommend watch if you're this far in and you might as well continue. But uh, okay, so I, but I, I knew in the end that you know they survived for many more centuries. So that's the big picture swerve. But the tactics and composition of the Byzantine army also got an upgrade. While infantry remained a staple, the Byzantines kept up with trends by remodeling the old Roman legionary into the fancy new scutatoi. Namely, they ditched the scutum for the hotness that is the kite shield, which explains why the name scutatoi literally means shield boys. And there to support our favorite shieldy boys were the toxotai. Archers, but the biggest and the baddest unit in the Byzantine army was the Cataphract. These guys were basically hoplites on horses, with the steed and the rider decked out head to hoof in scale. Damn, even its eyes? I mean, I guess that makes sense, but it, it, it seems as if... You, you'd think, like, you'd want to make a slight opening. I, I know it, the danger of getting an arrow or something in there, but... What if dust collects? Uh, it dirt. I just don't see how that eye covering. I mean, it must have worked. Armor. The name technically means fully armored, but I personally prefer to translate it as full metal cavalry. Cataphracts were first introduced as a counter to the Arabic cavalry, which otherwise ran circles around the poor defenseless Scutatoi, but eventually the cataphracts became the core of the Byzantine army and a byword for Byzantine power. Infantry and archers would weaken an enemy's line, and then the cataphracts would swoop in to hammer through the weak points and just shatter the enemy's formations. GG. And as an empire that's about 75% coast, the Byzantine Byzantines had ports to protect on all sides, in the Aegean, along the Mediterranean, and on the Black Sea, so they maintained a pretty beefy navy. In the world's best case of why mess with perfection, the Byzantines still used a version of the Trireme some 2,000 years later as their primary ship. The Dromon, as it became known, had been upgraded with a Latine sail and got absolutely loaded with catapults and ballistae. Plus, instead of simply ramming into enemy ships like some ancient Athenian doof, the Dromoi were equipped with spurs to smash enemy oars and immobilize them for of burning and or boarding. Slick upgrade. Unfortunately, the navy wasn't quite enough to stop repeated Muslim incursions into Crete, Sicily, and Sardinia, but they dutifully protected the mainland coasts, the islands of the Aegean, and the many trade routes that pass through Constantinople via the Bosphorus River. I have an idea for the fire. 
maybe keep it at a point if you're going to use a flamethrower or some type of flamethrower maybe it seemed in another picture that they were kind of creating it on the center of the deck of the ship which would seem like the worst part maybe use it slightly on the outer part of the ship where if it does kind of get out of hand you can like cut it out and it falls into the ocean i'm trying to think of a way that that they the, they kept the fire on the ship without it getting out of control. Anyways, not important right now. Muslim incursions into Crete, Sicily, and Sardinia, but they dutifully protected the mainland coasts, the islands of the Aegean, and the many trade routes that pass through Constantinople via the Bosphorus River. With iconoclasm over and the empire no longer teetering on the edge of total collapse, the Byzantines entered two centuries of prosperity and relative peace, starting with Basil I, who I really can't help but picture as just a leaf. A line of Macedonian emperors guided the Byzantine Empire through its golden age. I pictured it as a British guy, Basil as just a leaf, a line of Macedonian emperors guided the Byzantine Empire through its golden age, the peak of imperial prestige and of its cultural influence abroad. With the Muslim armies to the east more or less handled, the Byzantines turned their attention to the Bulgarians and used a clever mix of religious diplomacy to pacify them via conversion to Christianity. They did the same thing with Tsar Vladimir of the Kievan Rus, which set early Russia with its quasi-Greek Cyrillic alphabet and its Byzantine-leaning brand of Eastern Christianity. In return, Vladimir hooked the Byzantines up with the Varangian Guard, is this where the Eastern Orthodox split happens? Legendary band of Scandinavian mercenaries who served as the Emperor's royal guard for centuries. Now this was no Pax Romana, so the Byzantines still had to fight on many fronts. You know how like the Russia has this different sort of uh, church, like you see those guys sometimes walking around and like pic with pictures with Putin or something, and they have they're all decked out. So is this the start of that, uh, where that splits? And the Bulgarians even swiped northern Greece in the 900s. Wait, wait do Eastern Orthodox people? Um, uh, recognize the Pope? And still had to fight on many fronts, and the Bulgarians even swiped northern Greece in the 900s, later recovered by the Herculean efforts of Emperor Basil II a century later, but compared to the way that things were, the Byzantines were doing great. Meanwhile, Constantinople had never been better. By 1000 AD, it held half a million people and remained the largest, best defended, and most magnificent city in the world. Hagia Sophia was one of countless churches to get gorgeous new decorations after iconoclasm. And times clearly changed, but Constantinople remained a beautiful window into the classical world with roman style churches a cartoonishly huge chariot stadium and marble That's as awesome. far as the eye could see and all across the empire byzantine architects were hard at work building gorgeous urban cathedrals and cliffside monasteries but funnily enough our best looks at peak byzantine art come not just from outside the empire but from its rivals to the west venice and the normans made for some of constantinople's oddest frenemies because much as they used spears and ships to snag some byzantine power and prosperity for themselves they were the most enthusiastic adopters of the Byzantine style. Seriously, between St. Mark's Basilica and the Palatine Chapel, Italy is the best place to see Golden Age art. Then, of course, there's the way the Ottomans co-opted the Byzantine aesthetic, but whoo-hoo, that is a problem for later. Culturally, things had never been better, but politically, the cracks hear. in the proverbial mosaic were starting to show. The Byzantines had been steadily reaching back out to the Balkans and out of Anatolia, but the empire was much more comfortable being on the defensive than the offensive at this point, and the carefully constructed Thematus system began suffering from bloat. Strategoi got complacent and ignored their civic duties to play Monopoly men within their Thema, and between Theodosian walls and gold-covered domes, cushy bureaucrats in Constantinople barely raised their heads from their books. So each camp blamed the other for the Empire's problems, and both did exactly nothing to fix it. The Emperor, for his part, didn't help matters by completely ignoring the Themata and relying more and more on the Tagma, a standing army meant primarily for campaigning. This put the Byzantines in an extremely precarious... What, what was wrong with the, the Roman shield. It seems like I'd much rather have it than one of these. I mean, what's even the point of of why not just make it a circle? I, I guess it, it provides some some protection to the legs, but why not just make it? Is that is the edge used as a weapon? Um. Also, the the point of the the is this just for decoration? This kind of metal sphere, uh, surrounded by the four metal dots have some use, practical use. 
Drachma, a standing army meant primarily for campaigning. This put the Byzantines in an extremely precarious situation, spread way too thin and poorly prepared to face new threats, like trying to stab your enemies with a limp spaghetti. To the west, the Normans swooped into southern Italy to conquer the last little Byzantine pockets, and to the east, the Seljuk Turks dunked on the Byzantines so badly that Anatolia just disappeared. And they didn't even have to try that hard to do it. Half the Byzantine army deserted en route to the Battle of Manzikert. Seljuks wanted to sign a fair truce, but the emperor refused. The army was careless and got enveloped by Seljuk cavalry. Can I much? Can I? Can I? As terms of truce, Seljuks didn't advance into Anatolia for two years, but the Byzantines were still so busted, they just folded anyway. Half the army deserted. In 1071, and the generals made a series of miscalculations on their way to an entirely avoidable outcome. By 1075, the empire had never been smaller or weaker. You'd hope that the Greeks would know a little thing or two about hubris, but apparently not. And unfortunately for our Grec boys here, the 10 hundreds only frayed the already dodgy relationship between the churches in Constantinople and Rome. Justinian's big shiny idea of one church and one empire went kaput as soon as the southern half of the Mediterranean went poof, and Byzantine authority in Rome remained only nominal at best. When the Papal States officially split in 754, it was only a formality. Communication between East and West was already tricky because of how few Byzantines spoke Latin and how few Romans spoke Greek. Plus, tiffs like iconoclasm exacerbated disagreements about whether the Pope had supreme spiritual authority or whether the Byzantines had the right to mind their own business. These views were fundamentally incompatible, and this multi-century spat came to a head when a Roman delegate excommunicated the entire Byzantine church in the middle of Hagia Sophia in the I was gonna say something and then I didn't pause and now I forget what I was gonna say and it was important um oh right as I'm seeing this I'm not really putting it so much on failures of the Byzantines I, I know he's pointing out some failures that that if treated differently could have been better like people blaming each other and not doing much about it but it seems like they should have been dead a long time ago and the mere fact that they're surviving at all as an empire um, is impressive. Middle of mass. Damn. So the Greeks were century spat came to a head when a Roman delegate excommunicated the entire Byzantine church in the middle of Hagia Sophia in the middle of mass. Damn. So the Greeks responded with excommunications of their own, and just like that, we've got a schism. While nobody at the time quite recognized the implications, this marked the final split of ties between the Catholic Church in Rome and the Eastern Orthodox Church. But one Byzantine emperor saw this as a rare opportunity. Alexios I ended nearly a decade of civil war to assume the throne in 10 81, and his Komnenoi dynasty oversaw a remarkable revival of Byzantine fortunes through the 1100s. He held the empire steady for nearly four decades, made new trade agreements with fortunes through ten, wait, ten what? the 1100s, and his Komnenoi dynasty first ended nearly a decade of civil war to assume the throne in 1081, and his Komnenoi dynasty oversaw a so Hastings happened a few decades ago up over in uh, Great Britain. That's what's going on over there. Remarkable revival of Byzantine fortunes through the Off 1100s. Topic. He held the empire steady for nearly four decades, made new trade agreements with the Venetians, and hatched a clever plan to regain Anatolia. He went to Pope Urban with the offer to recognize papal supremacy in exchange for a dispatch of soldiers to help with the Byzantine reconquest. But Urban's hearing was a little selective because he ended up sending along several armies worth of European bandits who wanted to... Let me make sure I'm reading this right. Retake the Holy Land. Huh. Things are connecting. I love it. This is my favorite part. It doesn't happen. It happens in like 5% of videos that I watch. But every now and then, it's just like what I learned in one video and what I'm learning in a video I'm watching just clash together and sort of start that bond of connecting what I know in history. <laughs> and I love these moments. Okay. Let me make sure I'm reading this right. Retake the holy. Sorry, it's like. It's like. Watching a movie, like watching Lord of the Rings and. And like learning about what happened, like everyone knows Lord of the Rings, right? And then like learning about what happened in in. Uh, what's that big final battle called? Minas Tirith, all right? You following me here? And, like, learning about Minas Tirith, and then Gandalf and Pippin come along, and then you're like, oh, th this is when it, it... Now the stories are converging. You know what I mean? I, it's, it's such a good 
like when I'm learning about this side of the history, when I've already learned about like the, the crusades and other videos, and then I'm, I'm seeing that from a different perspective. I hope I'm being clear on that because that's my favorite part about this uh, whole experience. Holy Land. One huh. Of them. Reading this right. Retake the Holy Land. Huh. Well, that wasn't the plan at all. All right, so now Alexios had to wrangle this box of oops all crusaders and point them towards Jerusalem so they didn't go crusading all over his empire instead. Deus Unsurprisingly, does not the crusaders were much more excited to conquer their own lands than to bother restoring lost Byzantine territories, and subsequent crusades would only entangle the Byzantines further into the mess that is medieval European politics and earn them nothing but antagonism from their western neighbors. Meanwhile, the Normans were constantly poking and prodding into Greece, and soon enough the Venetians had a monopoly on Byzantine trade. But despite all all that, the Komnenoi left the empire a lot better than they first got it, having reclaimed coastal Anatolia, modernized the economy by Venetian supervision, and continued to make church loads of gold-covered art. Honestly, I feel like that's kind of the Byzantine motto at this point. Definitely precarious, but hey, it could have been a lot worse. And we'll find out how this eternally perilous situation resolves in part three, but for now, let's recap. When we picked up this chapter of Byzantine history, the empire was in a really bad yeah. way, what with the hemorrhaging provinces and smashing all of their art. And it's not an accident that they went on to steady their empire and revitalize their culture. The Byzantines survived and then dug themselves out of the Dark Ages by being clever and not giving up. The Thema system is a genius innovation in statecraft and it bought the Byzantines an entire golden age to work with. And of course, as time went on, they got a little careless, but when things got dire, they persevered and turned things around again. I don't just like Byzantine history in spite of their setbacks, I love Byzantine history because they're a golden design disaster empire damn it remember in life it doesn't matter they do well with what they were given how you get knocked down or how you lose all of north africa Getting or back. all of greece or anatolia too jeez those guys have really been through a lot what matters <laughs> what matters is that you keep on trying no matter what because golden ages can dawn when you least expect it sometimes you can't realize a golden age until you're out of it Thank you so much for watching. Stories like this remind you. me that there is never, never a dull moment in Greek history. No That's true. I do have to kind of look at this as Greek history. I, I don't know why I didn't really see it as it when it really is the, uh, the center of attention in the Byzantine Empire. Okay. Awesome video. See you guys next time.